Now, we've been in a sermon series on the parables of Jesus, and if you're unfamiliar with what a parable is, uh, it is just a story that's meant to teach you a main point. And oftentimes, parables can be slightly mysterious as you go through it, and sometimes you really have to dig deep to, to unpack it. And, uh, and that's the truth for this parable that we're going to look at today. It's the truth for all the parables that Jesus teaches. These parables that Jesus teaches are always meant for those who have ears to hear. And they're always meant for those who have ears to hear to be molded by what they hear and what they understand. And so today, I just want to encourage you, as you hear uh, what Jesus has to say, as you hear this story, don't let it just be a story that you try to really kind of break down and, and understand so that you can then go share it with someone else, but allow it to go deep into your heart so that it might transform you as well. And so that being said, I just want to take a moment and pray for the preaching of God's word. Would you go to the Lord with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that your word is powerful. Lord, we thank you that your word is never meant uh, to cause us to be in a place of shame, um, but Lord, is always meant to be in a place of encouragement and conviction and strength. And so, God, we pray right now that as we go to your word, Lord, that you would allow us to experience that. Lord, would you do your work in us that we might be stronger Lord, that we might uh, be more on mission than before. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. May we have ears to hear and may we have the courage to act. Our passage for today is Luke chapter 16, and it's going to start in verse 19. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. If you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn there right now. It'll also be up here for you on the screen. Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus begins, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abram said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this parable is intense, and uh, it doesn't immediately seem clear, right? So how do we make sense of the story that Jesus tells well, what I'd like to do with you guys today is I'd like to look at the following so that we might be able to answer that question. How do we make sense of this story? I want us to look at the context. I want us to look at the contrasts. I want us to look at the consequences. And I want us to look at the calling. The context, the contrasts, the consequences, and the calling. So let's take a look at the context for this, par this parable. Now, in order to understand any parable, it's really important that you stop and you look at where the parable takes place in the larger narrative of Scripture and the larger narrative of the Gospels. And so we want to stop and rewind the tape just a little bit and go back to the beginning of chapter 16. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 16, verse 1, you would see that even though Jesus is surrounded by Pharisees, tax collectors, and a huge crowd of people, he suddenly turns to his disciples and he continues to teach them about the kingdom. At different times in chapter 15, he really focused in on talking to the tax collectors and the Pharisees, but now he's turning back to his disciples. And specifically, as he's teaching them in the first part of chapter 16, he's teaching them to steward their possessions. He wants them to recognize that money can become 
a master. And his ultimate point was expressed in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, right before our parable, when he told him this. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, even though Jesus was talking just to the disciples at this point, the Pharisees and and everyone else, they were listening in. And uh, this teaching moment with the disciples really caused the Pharisees to to react. And so we see this swell of reaction from them in verse 14. Again, right before our passage. Look at verse 14 and what Luke tells us uh, they do just as soon as Jesus is done talking. Verse 14 says this, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, And they ridiculed him. They had jokes about Jesus. One pastor describes the Pharisees' response in this way. He says, money has a grip on their hearts, and they react to Jesus as if their lover has been spurned. Now, the historical context for this tells us that the Pharisees, that they were often wealthy, and they were accustomed to viewing earthly wealth and blessings as a reward for their faith. Say it another way, the Pharisees thought that if you had money and resources, it was because you had a lot of faith, and God was pleased with you. And on the other side of the coin, they thought that if you didn't have wealth and resources, it was because you lacked faith and were being cursed by God for some unfaithful act that you had done. Maybe you remember the story of Job, and you remember Job's best friends, right, that came around Job after everything had been taken from him, and they basically said to him, bro, what did you do, right? Right? We know that it wasn't anything that Job did. This has never been what the Old Testament has taught, but it was what the Pharisees had come to believe. Once again, they believed that if you were blessed with riches, then you were the ones that God favored. And it functioned for them as a preview of eternity. In their minds, they thought they were going to get the best positions in heaven. I don't know about you, but how many people do you know don't have much but have the most amount of faith, right? Right? The Pharisees weren't understanding properly. They were adhering to what we call today the prosperity gospel. And so why do I tell you this? Well, I tell you this context because it's really important for understanding this parable. The reaction really helps us to know that this parable is all about how you and I understand our earthly riches and our salvation. And the main point of this parable is this, that our earthly riches are not an indicator of our faith but how we spend our earthly riches is. Our earthly riches are not an indicator of our faith, but how we spend our earthly riches is. So with this in mind, let's move on to the the, the contrast. Let's move on to the contrast in this parable. Now the first contrast that we see is that there is a rich man and there is a poor man. There's somebody who has a lot and there's someone who has little to nothing. Now, it's not like this oftentimes here in America, but in the rest of the world, we know that this is pretty standard. There's those who are rich and have the most, and then there's no middle class. There's everybody who has nothing. And in fact, in this time, in the ancient Near East, that was the case. In their society, they were rich and poor. And so this is very normal, very familiar uh, types of depictions that Jesus is starting off, here, start, starting off here with. Now our second contrast is this, that the poor man gets a name, but the rich man is unnamed. The poor man gets a name, but the rich man is unnamed. Now the poor man's name is very important. The poor man's name is Lazarus. Now, the name Lazarus was the third most popular name at that time in that area, which means that Jesus is probably just positioning this man as your average guy in a world of two classes, rich and poor. Lazarus is meant to represent the entire group of people, the poor, the desperate, the vulnerable, the under-resourced population. And while you might think it's the opposite about Lazarus, we should know that his name actually has a very significant meaning. Lazarus, which comes from the Hebrew name Eleazar, actually means the one that God helps. The one that God helps. And finally, if you remember From the Gospel of John, Lazarus is actually one of Jesus' closest friends. This is the name of one of his closest friends that he decides to include in this story. Remember, Lazarus was raised back from the dead by Jesus in John chapter 11. This poor man has a name. And the choice of his name shows the value 
and the friendship that God extends towards those who are in similar positions. If you're here with, with us today and you would say, ah, I think I might be in that poor category. Well, you need to know that your God has a deep affection and friendship towards you. And this, again, should come as no surprise to us as we read throughout the Scripture, right? That, that Jesus, in this story, gives this type of name with this type of significance to this character. Because our God has always had a priority for the poor. The poor are, are, are those who God takes special interest in helping. And we see that throughout the Scripture. If you were to look at the Bible, you would see that there's over 300 references to caring for the poor. And throughout the Old Testament, you would see that the law has always commanded the people of God to care for and administer justice to the poor. And throughout the Old Testament, Jesus demonstrated the concern for the poor in what he said and what he did. And then throughout the New Testament, the early church always focused on the poor. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he was set out on his missionary journey from Jerusalem, look at what Paul says the early leaders told him to make sure that he did. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. And of course, you might remember what Jesus said when he stood up in that synagogue and he gave his mission statement to the world. And he quoted Isaiah. What did he say? He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Luke 4, 18 through 19. The poor, na- the poor man named Lazarus, the one that God helps, was no accident in this story. God has always cared for and come to the aid of the poor. In church, he's always asked his followers to do the same. And again, here's the second contrast in the story. The poor man gets a name, but the rich man doesn't. Verse 19 just calls him a rich man. Now, if you were to look at some of the older translations of Scripture, you would see uh, that in some of those Bible translations, they, they call this man dives or dives. And, and I, you can understand why they do that, because dives is from the Latin, and dives just means rich man when, uh, in Latin. And so what happened was they took the Greek New Testament and they translated it into Latin and then into English, and, and dives just carried over, and so they thought, this guy's name is dives, but it's not his name. So if your translation calls him dives, he never had a name. That's not his name. He's just the unnamed rich man. And to support this claim, you can go and see parable after parable where Jesus continues to introduce these parables with this introduction. There was a rich man. I don't think dives was this like central character that Jesus kept referencing. Just like the poor man, this rich man was undoubtedly meant to represent an entire class of affluent people. And more particularly, he was meant to represent these wealthy Pharisees that he was addressing. Now, our third contrast is this. It has to do with what each of them wore. The rich man was covered with, covered and clothed in purple and fine linen, verse 19. And if you know anything about purple, purple was something that was extremely valuable back then. You'd only see it in royal courtrooms, or you would only see it with people who had lots of money because it was taken from this shellfish that was really hard to find, and they would squeeze the shellfish, and a purple dye would come out. You may remember Lydia and how she used to trade in those goods, and so she was super wealthy and was then able to provide for the local church out of the money that she made. But this purple dye would have been super expensive, and this man wore it every day. He also wore, wore fine linen, which was made from Egyptian cotton. And if you guys know anything about, you know, when it comes time to buy bed sheets, right, Egyptian cotton is the nicest stuff we can still buy, right? We make sure and look at that thread count. Well, this man, because of his affluence, would wear it every single day. This man, it was like he wore Armani and Versace and Gucci, and, and every time he went to work out, he was rocking Lululemon every single day. How many people know how expensive Lululemon is, right? <laughs> this man wore that every day and enjoyed his wealth. Lazarus on, Lazarus, on the other hand, he was covered in sores, verse 20. He had no clothes, none whatsoever, 
but he was covered in sores. The text also explains that uh, those sores were open, that they were untreated, which means that he couldn't afford medical care. And furthermore, the fact that the dogs were actually licking his sores shows his defeated state. Maybe you've seen someone who, who sits and watches as a fly lands on an open cut or on their eye, and they don't brush it away. Why? Because they've kind of given up. That's what's happening here to Lazarus. Emotionally, he's also poor. He's defeated. The fourth contrast that we see here is how and what they ate. The rich man feasted sumptuously while the poor man desired to be fed from what fell from the rich man's table. One theologian talks about this. He says back in those days, they used to take the bigger pieces of extra bread and they would wipe their hands like the piece, those pieces of bread were like napkins and they would just wipe their hands and then discard them on the floor. And typically the dogs would eat those up. That is what this man is hoping to get, those scraps of extra bread so he can just survive. One man had all he wanted to eat and the other just hoped to survive. The fifth and final contrast has to do with power. Now, the text doesn't say that this rich man was corrupt or that he was evil. However, the, the, the text does tell us that every single day, Lazarus was laid at his gate, at his gate. Now, the term for laid here is not something where it's like gently placing somebody in front of his gate. In fact, the term here is only used when it's talking about someone who's been cast out or who's been thrown down, someone who's been discarded, who's been tossed aside, someone who's been made an outcast or an outsider. If you've ever felt like that, that's what Lazarus was. He was treated that way. He was thrown out. And we could assume that the rich man had a part in it. Now, why does it matter that I mentioned that it was his gate? Well, we need to understand, right, that Lazarus had no earthly power, that he was vulnerable, and, and that there was someone who was in charge, and it was this rich man. But why is it important to know that this was his gate? Because back in the ancient Near Eastern times, the gate was actually a place where appeals for justice were made, where decisions were cast. You may remember the story of Ruth and Boaz. How does Boaz secure Ruth? But because he's an elder at the gate, and he goes to the gate, and he makes a deal to get her and bring about justice. The gate for the ancient Near Eastern cultures was a courtroom, and this rich man would have been a powerful elder at the gate. He was somebody who had the ability to bring about change. And essentially, every day, the poor man was at his gate, begging not just for money, but for restoration. And with every day that passed, the rich man in our story proclaimed the same verdict. No mercy and no justice for you. No mercy and no justice for you. Now, the Pharisees listening to the story, they were like the rich man. They enjoyed their wealth and they ignored the pleas of the poor that were in their community. They closed their ears to the Lazaruses at their gate because they did not recognize the responsibility that they had to the poor. Brothers and sisters, the Bible has a lot to say about those who are rich. And it is not that those who are rich are terrible people or that they will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's not what it says. Remember, the one person, aside from Lazarus, who's named in the story, is Abraham. And Abraham is where? He's in heaven. Now, if you remember Father Abraham, he was extremely wealthy in his day. He would have been a very, very rich man. No. Instead, what the Bible always does is it warns us against trusting in our wealth for salvation and identity. Look at what Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Furthermore, the Bible warns against greed and idolatry. Look at what Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. And maybe you remember what the Apostle Paul taught Timothy. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 6, 10. 
There are two main characters in this story. There are Lazarus, who's desperately poor, naked, starving, without any power. And there's an unnamed rich man who loves his wealth so much that he has wandered from the faith and has no mercy or justice for the poor. Let's take a look at the consequences. The parable then takes an unexpected turn, right? For everybody listening, they can't imagine what just happened, but the characters die. And the rich man, he faces extreme consequences. The text tells us that the rich man went to Hades, where he was tormented, while Lazarus died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Verse 22. One went to Hades, and one went to heaven. Now, why do I say heaven? Well, it's because Hebrews 11 talks about how Abraham is in the heavenly city that God prepared for him and all the others who by faith were saved by grace. And so if Lazarus in the story is at Abram's side, then he must be in heaven. And the term that Abraham's side here is actually more like Abraham's bosom. It's more like Abraham's chest. It's as close of an embrace as it gets. Maybe some of you have held a newborn before. What do you do? You hold them close to your chest, right, so that they can feel your heartbeat. And it's often in those places where they feel the most safe, where they feel the most peace, where they find the most rest, where they experience the most comfort. You know, the same Greek word that's used here is the same word that's used to describe the embrace between God the Father and Jesus the Son in John 1, 18. And this terminology is the same that we find when the Apostle John is described as reclining against the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. Now, Lazarus, being in heaven, would have been absolutely appalling for the Pharisees because it was not in their understanding of how spiritual things worked. Salvation was for the super righteous like them who kept all the laws and were being financially rewarded by God. If Abraham represents uh, the one who receives the, the ultimate righteousness and salvation, how in the world is Lazarus with Abraham, they would have said. And if the destination of Lazarus in the story frustrated them, they would have been even more angry to see the rich man who was clearly their representative being placed in Hades. Now, I've been saying Hades, I haven't been saying hell. What do we mean by Hades? Well, during that time in Israel, Hades was a place outside the city where the brush and the trash was thrown out and burned. It was not a good place to be, and it represented death and separation. We know that Hades in this story was hot, right? Because what does the rich man say? He says in verse 24, I am in anguish in this flame. And so if Hades is a trash heap that's on fire, the rich man is right in the middle of it. And we also know if we look at Jewish literature at the time that the Pharisees believed that when you died, you would either go to one or two places. You'd either wait for the final judgment in the presence of the blessed, or you'd go to Hades, the realm of the cursed. And they believed that the blessed and the damned could actually talk to one another, right? All this is written in an extra biblical book um, called uh, Fourth Ezra, if you want to go back and look it up. And so what Jesus is doing is he's basically using their worldview. He's using their perspective. He's using what they understand to be true. And he's, he's inserting that into the story to make a point. Which means that you and I, when we read this story, we shouldn't look at the story and conclude that this is exactly what heaven is like. Or this is exactly what hell is like. If you're going to heaven, they're not going to be able to jeer at you from hell. <laughs> and you're not going to be able to point back and laugh from heaven. And you shouldn't. Right? But that's not the case. We should look at this as a parable, as a story. This is not a perfect description of heaven or hell, and it's not meant to be. Instead, we should understand the larger point that Jesus is making, that our earthly riches are not an indicator of our faith, but how we spend our earthly riches is. And this all leads, leads us uh, to what the parable calls us towards. So let's look at the calling. The Pharisees, they were religious people. They were the church people. They were people just like you and me. They were wealthy, like all of us. Oh, wait a second, Pastor John. Or I'm just John now. Wait a second, John. I, I don't think I'm rich. I don't think I'm wealthy. Well, if you were to go and Google and start to look at what other people in this world make, what other people in this world have, you would find out that the majority of this world has nothing compared to you. <laughs> 
no matter where you fall on the spectrum of how much you think you have or don't have. We are all wealthy by world standards. Maybe some of us might say we're not wealthy by American standards, but we are all wealthy by world standards. So if you don't think you're Bill Gates and you don't think this applies to you, no, the truth is it does apply to you. All of us are wealthy. And so as we think about this, regardless of if we have a mansion or a smaller apartment, we need to understand that this word is for us too. The rich man represents the Pharisees, and, it was meant, and this was meant to warn them, and in the same way, it warns us. The first part of the calling of this parable is this, that it calls us away from idolatry. It calls us away from idolatry. Now, now what do I mean by idolatry? Idolatry is simply this, elevating anything in our lives in terms of value above God, above Christ and his kingdom purposes. The rich man here clearly valued having the nicest clothes and having the best food, and, and, and he used his money to get those things. You know, there's several commandments, and there's so much deep revelation that we find about God's character in the Old Testament law and the prophets, and they should have all shown this rich man that part of worshiping God is actually providing for the poor out of your resources, out of your resources, and treating them with justice and with mercy. But rather than worshiping God and following his commands, the rich man worshiped his pleasures and the wealth that secured it for him. You know, most of us in the room today would say that we love God and that we call him the Lord of our lives. And as we've established, he calls us to care for the poor. And we find that all the poor that we find at the gates of our lives. And yet, the statistics state that on average, a Christian in America gives about 2.5% of their income to charity. 2.5%. Now, if those statistics are even close to accurate for us, then we must ask, who is our true God? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ and what he calls us towards? Or is it money and the pleasures that it brings? Remember what Jesus said said in Matthew 7 when he warned the crowds, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and, and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, we might say, Jesus, I went to church every Sunday. I attended Connect Group faithfully. I even did stay and pray, and I served on the hospitality team. I even did River Kids, Jesus. <laughs> and not that any of those things are bad. In fact, you should do all those things. Keep doing those things, and please sign up for River Kids. But at your core, what does your Lord, what does Jesus require of you but to act justly? to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6.8. You see, the rich man was not providing justice. He was not showing mercy, and he was proud in how he lived for himself. This parable warns us against idolatry. Brothers and sisters, hear this in the best way. Jesus wants your whole heart, and he wants your whole life. He doesn't want just a part of you. This parable also calls us to look to serve and not be served. The rich man in the story, he's in Hades, and he's still treating Lazarus like a servant. Look at verse 24. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He wants some relief. And even in his condemned state, he still thinks he's better than Lazarus. And he wants him to serve him by bringing him water. That's a kind of disgusting way to bring him water, but that's what he wants. And after Abraham refuses, the rich man asks Abraham to send Lazarus to go and then warn his family. Verse 27, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. This rich man's view of the poor is that they are servants, and it shows his heart to be proud and to be selfish. As we consider those in our midst who are maybe desperately poor, those who you see on the street or those who you know 
in your community who have nothing. May we not look at them as less than us, but may we look to be their greatest servants. How could you serve them? How could you get down and help them? Not the other way around. Finally, this parable calls us to read the word of God and to obey it. Look at 27, verse 27 again. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. <laughs> Abraham tells the rich man that the rich man's brothers, which represent the whole family uh, of um, the, the family or his household um, that he has, that they have Moses and the prophets. And what he's talking about is the book of Moses, right? The book of Moses, which walks through the entire law and over and over again. We saw that the law through Leviticus and Deuteronomy called the people of God to take responsibility for the poor. And to execute justice for them, to show them mercy, to stand up for the vulnerable. And the reference to the prophets is, once again, it's a nod to the many times throughout the prophetical books where God denounces Israel's actions, where they oppressed the vulnerable, and they denied them justice. In fact, that's why they were taken off into exile, because they worshipped other gods, and because they denied justice to the quartet of the vulnerable. Furthermore, the prophets also point to God as being in his character very concerned for justice. This reference to Moses and the prophets, it demonstrates that the rich man and all the Israelites are responsible for their actions and they had fair warning through God's word. Abraham declares that if they do not do the will of God now, it doesn't matter if someone rises from the dead, they won't make that person their Lord, and listen to anything they have to say. Brothers and sisters, the greatest teacher could come and spend hours teaching you God's concern for the poor and the commandments that he gives and how he always connects stewardship of resources and wealth to idolatry. But as Christians, if we would just read our Bibles and seek to obey what we read, it's all right there. The question for all of us is, are we reading and courageously responding to what God's word is calling us towards? Now, the rich man in this story failed to live with good stewardship of the resources that God gave him. And if all of us in this room are honest, including me, all of us rich men and women, we've done the same. We've all failed. How many people do you see when you walk the streets? How many people do you see outside your apartment or your home? How many people do you see at school? How many people do you know that you just haven't had time for or you haven't helped in some way? We've all failed in this way. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we're all headed for the dumpster fire of Hades? Is that what that means? Brothers and sisters, please let me encourage you there is another rich man whose riches cannot be counted, yet instead of remaining on his throne in his humility, he came to the gates of earth to bring mercy. There is another rich man who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. There is another rich man who was clothed in purple by Roman soldiers and who died for his friends in the ultimate act of justice. There is another rich man who, even though he was buried and lay dead for three days, he conquered the grave and did, in fact, rise from the dead. Oh, brothers and sisters, there is another rich man, and his name is Jesus. And Jesus, although he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. Amen? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Jesus is the only one who fulfills this calling perfectly. And it is Jesus who met us at the gate and applied the balm to our spiritual sores, brought us to his table, and showed himself to be the bread of life. Jesus is the one who calls us to do likewise and care for the Lazaruses at our gates. 
that we might surrender over our riches so that others may know him and have the richness of the gospel. Jesus is the one who gives us grace when we fail and invites us to try again and show mercy as we have received mercy. Jesus cares about our hearts, church. He cares about our direction much more than our perfection. You see, Jesus offers you and me today not a path towards earthly riches or worldly pleasures, but a way towards salvation for all of those who would confess their sin, place their trust in him and his work on the cross, and commit to follow him all the days of their lives. If you've never received Jesus as Lord, can I tell you, the pursuits of this world are hollow, and they're hopeless. They may be full of pleasures, but they'll run out. Come today to the only one who can make you whole, the only one who can restore you, the only one who can make you eternally rich in relationship to him. If you do know Jesus, but you've forgotten that this is a part of worshiping him, if your wealth and your desire to enjoy earthly pleasures is keeping you from caring for the desperate and the poor, then I pray today, repent and reestablish Jesus as your Lord in this way and join him as he cares for the Lazaruses at the gates of this world. May we be reminded today of how God loves us and may we go out and do the same. May we not have our earthly pleasures and our earthly treasures be what we bow down to. May that not reflect, may our actions not reflect a false God that we worship. And may we remember, as this parable teaches, that our earthly riches are not an indicator of our faith, but how we spend our earthly riches is.